Good afternoon. My name is Thais Kawanoven. What the Chinese means is Ke Wenzai. And I work here in Suzhou as an astrophysicist. My work is to study the universe. And in particular, my research is about trying to understand how the stars that you see tonight, how they formed, whether they have planets, and what happened to those planets over time. Are they habitable? Do they look like planet Earth? So when I was a young boy, I grew up in the Netherlands, not very far from where this photo was taken. And I regularly looked up in the sky, and I wondered, like all these stars and planets, where did they come from, and can I travel there when I grow up? Can I go there in a spaceship? And also, could there be life out there? And with so many stars out there, billions and billions of stars out there, there should be a planet that looked like planet Earth, right? And could there be aliens? Could they travel to planet Earth? Could they visit us? Well, I didn't know at that time. And now, 30 years later, I still don't know. Um, here you see a picture of a galaxy. A galaxy consisting of more than a hundred billion stars. And we live in a galaxy that looks a bit similar like this one. Our galaxy is called Milky Way, also with hundreds of billions of stars. And many of those stars, they have planets. Actually, in our Milky Way galaxy, there's one little star on the outside of that galaxy, and that star we call Sun. Our sun is a star. All the other stars are also suns. So our sun has eight planets. So maybe the other stars, they might also have planets, right? And our sun has one planet which is habitable. One planet where humans can live, where life can exist. And so far, planet Earth is the only, space in, the only place in the universe where, as far as we know, life exists. Actually, with such an incredibly large universe, the universe is huge, billions and trillions of stars and planets. There should be many places that look a little bit like this, right? There should be many planets that look like Earth with life on it. But so far, we've been looking around, we haven't found any evidence for life. Why is that? Well, to understand that question, we can split it up in two parts. The first part is how common are actually planets like this? And the second question is, well, if planets like this exist, how common is, is life on such planets? Are we a special place in the universe or are these kind of places very common? Well, let's take a look at these questions. So the first one is, well, how common are these planets in the universe? So here you see a picture of the constellation of Orion. You can see it tonight if you go outside, if it's not cloudy. You can recognize it in the, by the three stars in the middle. Very easily you can recognize it. So when you look at Orion, you will see a couple of stars and a big black background and it looks like empty space. But when you look with an infrared camera that detects heat radiation, you will actually see much more. You will see that there's actually a lot of stuff between the stars. And as astronomers, we, we call that gas and dust. Gas and dust in space. And that, there's actually a lot of stuff there, and that stuff has gravity. These big gas clouds in space, they attract each other. They become smaller, they merge, they clump together. And they form stars, and you can actually see at the yellow spots there, that's where new stars are forming. And that's where new planets are forming. So if you come back here, take a picture two million years later, you will see some planets, maybe some of them look like Earth. So schematically, this is what happens. You start out with a very big gas cloud in space, have a lot of gravity, it becomes smaller, takes, takes maybe a million years or two million years or so. And then it clumps together in the center. 99% of the material goes to the center and forms a star. And the other 
of the material forms a disk around that star. And it keeps orbiting, that material keeps orbiting that star for maybe 10 million years. But in the meantime, it is making planets, such as planet Earth. So this is how we think planet Earth forms. So you have a star, a newly formed star, with a gas disk around it. In that gas disk, you have atoms, molecules, they stick together, they form dust particles that also stick together and ultimately grow and grow and grow to stones, big stones of a meter, of a kilometer. And some of them that are big enough start due to their gravity attracting even more of this material. And this gro they grow very fast. So in our solar system, we had eight of these very big ones that happened to accrete all the leftover material and form planets. So you see those stones there, actually not all of them are gone. Some of them are still flying around the solar system today. And if one of them collides with the Earth tonight, you will see a falling star, if it's a small one. If it's a big one, then we have a problem, right? So that's what happened to the dinosaurs. They were killed by an impact of one of these asteroids. In the meantime, the sun starts shining. And the sun already, due to its intense radiation, it blows away the very light materials, the hydrogen, helium, the materials that make up the atmosphere. And the heavy ones, like rock and metal, they, they Stay near the sun. They say stay near the sun. So what you get if you do that, if you do a computer simulation, for example, and include all of this, you get a star and you get a couple of small planets made of stone and rock, like our planet Earth, with a very tiny atmosphere, but almost entirely made of rock and stone, and four huge planets, or three or five, depends a bit. This is what we expect from the theory of planet formation. It works for our solar system, but does it also work for other solar systems? And that was a big question up to about 20 years ago. 20 years ago, telescopes became strong enough to detect planets orbiting the stars that you see at night. Of course, it's very difficult because they are so far away. At the moment, we already know more than 3,500 planets outside our solar system. And of course, a more interesting question is, which one of these planets is actually suitable for life? Life as we know it, that needs liquid water to some degree. And this is, well, quantified in this, this plot. On the horizontal axis, you see the distance between a planet and a star. And on the vertical axis, you see, well, how hot is a star? How big, how luminous is a star? So for stars like our sun, if we want a planet like Earth to be habitable, it shouldn't be too cold, it shouldn't be too far away, it shouldn't be too close to the star, but it should be at the right spot, in the green zone. And we call this the habitable zone. So if you're outside that habitable zone, you can't live on that planet. But if you're in that habitable zone, it's, it's theoretically possible. But for those of you that look carefully, actually our neighbor planets, Venus and Mars, are also well, on the edge of this habitable zone. In theory, there may be life there, but it turns out, for some reason, it went wrong. Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold. And actually, our moon is exactly at the right spot, the perfect place. But our moon is also dead. Why is our moon dead? It doesn't have any atmosphere. So one requirement for life is temperature. But another one is atmosphere, and that's actually a very important one. The air which we breathe. So an atmosphere on a planet determines what, what happens on the surface of a planet. So, on our planet Earth, the atmosphere transports heat through winds. Our atmosphere is responsible for the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect, you always hear many bad stories about it, but actually it's good, because without that greenhouse effect, it would be minus 40 degrees in this room. 
The atmosphere also provides nutrients, oxygen for me, and carbon dioxide for the plants. And finally, we have an ozone layer that protects us from dangerous radiation from space. So if life wants to develop on a planet and develop over long periods of time into an advanced civilization, you need a stable atmosphere, or at least one that changes very slowly. And sometimes that goes wrong. So on our Earth, that went wrong a couple of times, actually quite a couple of times. We had asteroids impacting the Earth, comets colliding with the Earth, wiping off the dinosaurs of this planet. We had super volcanoes. We had stars exploding not so far away from the sun, sterilizing most of the Earth. So, so far, our Earth has survived all these natural disasters. Life has survived these natural disasters. Although with big pain every now and then. So, to sustain life for long periods of time, you need a good temperature and a good atmosphere. Even if you can avoid this, on some planets in the universe, you will have additional problems. You will have an advanced technology, an advanced civilization that messes up the planets. For example, if you have a star with a planet, and on that planet they discover nuclear energy and start making war with each other, that cannot end good. Fortunately, we survived that so far on our planet, right? We didn't have a nuclear war. Air pollution can be tremendous. Well, it's a bit of a problem now, right? But not so big that it is a problem for life. And finally, the greenhouse effect can go crazy. You may have seen that in the news. This is an example, Venus, where it went wrong with the greenhouse effect. It's incredibly hot now. It used to have oceans, but not anymore. It became too hot, too much CO2 in the atmosphere. That was not done by humans, by the way. This was just because the volcanoes happened to be a bit overactive. So what about planet Earth? What are we doing now to our atmosphere? So you see here a picture of CO2 levels over time, measured by astronomers on a mountain in Hawaii. The red curve shows the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere since I was born, which is, well, I'm not too young, but about a bit less than 40 years is it's a very short time on astronomical or geological timescales. Since I was born, CO2 levels went up by 20%, an incredible amount. So where does this trend come from? Where did it start? Fortunately, by studying the bubbles in the ice in Antarctica and Greenland, we can find out what the atmosphere looked like in the past. We can dig a hole, analyze the ice bubbles. And this is what you can find for the last 2,000 years. It was rather constant for 2,000 years until about well, 1850, 1900. What happened then? What happened at that time? That was the start of the Industrial Revolution. That was James Watt and his steam engine. That's when we started using coal and oil on a massive scale. And you see, CO2 levels have gone up by 40%. This is not the stock market of China. This is not the American dollar. This is the atmosphere of an entire planet. Sounds very dangerous to me. If you go back even further, and you can do that, this picture shows a million years of history, measurements of CO2 levels and temperatures then coupled to it. You see some variations. We have ice ages every now and then. These ice ages are natural, and actually they are, they are a result of astronomy. They are a result of the orbit of the Earth around the Sun changing. Sometimes it's a bit more circular, sometimes a bit more elliptical, sometimes a bit closer, sometimes a bit further. But that's part of my research, of astronomers like me. We, we try to figure out what the planets are doing, and we can predict this. And geologists, they measure this, and it turns out pretty well, except for the last part, you see. One million years of history of CO2 levels, and in just 100 years, 
which is absolutely nothing in geological or astronomical timescales. We are changing the Earth. We are changing the Earth. Sounds quite dangerous. So now, to go back to my original question, the question that I asked when I was still a young boy, so why are there so many stars and why haven't aliens come to visit us yet? That may relate to this, at least in my opinion. So, so far we have extremely good telescopes, we went into space, we've been to Mars, we sent out messages, radio signals, light signals into space, we've been listening. Space seems empty, at least nobody is there to say hello to us. Why is that? And the famous physicist Enrico Fermi, he actually brought that up one time in the academic community during a coffee time at the university. So he reasoned as follows, and I've shown you in the first part. First of all, the universe has an incredible number of stars, incredible number of planets, and therefore also, even if the chance may be very small, an enormous number of planets that look like Earth, planets that can potentially host life. And some of these planets will be forming today. Some of, us, some of them formed maybe a million years ago or a billion years ago. So civilizations there should be a billion years ahead in technology. Can you imagine what that looked like? There's some civilization there that is a hundred years ahead in technology or a thousand years or a million years. Incredible. They should be able to send messages to us, come say hello, but they don't. It seems quiet. Where are they? And that is called the Fermi Paradox. And of course, many people have thought about what the solutions of this could be. Why the universe so big full, should be full of Earth-like planets, and still we don't see anybody. Maybe we're the only ones in the universe, right? Or maybe we are just the first one. Or maybe we should be lucky nobody has found us yet. Or maybe they're hiding, right? Maybe they don't care about us. But actually, what I think is the picture on the right. So every now and then, a civilization is wiped out by an asteroid impact or an exploding star. That chance is relatively small. What I think is that civilizations, what they do, they build up their technology, and at some point, they make an end to their own lives. They mess up their planet so much, either through a nuclear war, or through changing the climate. Do you think an intelligent civilization would be so stupid to mess up their own planet? Well, I don't know the answer. We don't know much about what happens in space. The only thing I know is what happens on planet Earth. That's the only one I know. And what we're doing right now with planet Earth, we, we are changing planet Earth. We are changing the atmosphere right now at a tremendous rate. So when I was a young boy and I looked up to the stars and I wondered, where are these aliens? Why are we alone? Then I look at planet Earth, what we are doing right now, and I think, this may be a reason. And it's good to realize that. We're changing the atmosphere. It's a, Human, it's not natural, humans do it, and therefore we may also be able to do something about it. So this talk was about the universe, but actually it's also about you. This is your future, this planet. Let's take good care of it. Thank you.